I have the privilege of introducing my friend Sandra Seifert this morning. It's good to be here. Um, a couple of years ago, I was thinking of how we could run a specific conference, and the conference is called iShare. It's part of the Pacific Union Conference. And on Friday night, we feature specific Seventh-day Adventists who have a powerful testimony. People who have given their lives to the Lord, people who have gone through an amazing experience that can encourage young people. And through a series of what I call divine experiences and appointments, I was somehow led to find Sandra. I didn't know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church had their own modern-day Esther. A little bit about Sandra, she is half German, half Filipina, just like Pia, and just like Catriona. She is a fashion model, TV host, and a registered nurse who studied in New York. She is best known, of course, as winning Miss, Air, or, uh, Miss Earth Air in 2009. She grew up as a Catholic, but it's almost as if God had in mind that he wanted her to be Adventist because she was born in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital in Taiwan. She was blown away by hearing the Daniel chapter 2 Bible study, and it led her on her own personal journey to find God and to find the eight laws of health. She then continued on and she started her own modest clothing line, Suravia. It's a fashion brand dedicated to producing modern yet modest clothing for women. Today, she continues to run her company and she has a heavy celebrity following in the Philippines and she, her mission is to share the gospel through fashion. We're so thankful that Sandra came all the way from the Philippines to be with us. She will be our speaker for the Divine Hour. <laughs> Happy Sabbath! Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. I praise God for the Sabbath and the opportunity to make it to the United States safe and sound. I arrived three days ago and uh, surprisingly I've been able to adapt pretty well. No jet lag yet. <laughs> and uh, I'm so happy to be here this morning. Uh, so I give back all the glory to the Lord. Thank you also to uh, Michael Tuazan for that wonderful intro. I believe he shared like half of my testimony already. Just kidding, Mike. But um, honestly, I'm really excited to be here. And when I was asked to come to the States again, I thought to myself, and I talked to God about this, and I said, really, Lord, you really want me to come all the way from Manila to California and share messages for your people there? There are so many speakers in California. Why me? Or even in the United States. But I trust that your will is perfect and that there must be at least one soul in this big audience that will hopefully be touched by how God has worked mightily and beautifully in my life. So, just one soul, and I think heavens will be rejoicing. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to get started. Uh, one of the most uh, famous or popular questions I get asked usually um, is if I am actually a born Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, the answer is no. I wasn't actually born Seventh-day Adventist, but I was born in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital in Taipei, Taiwan in 1984. So if you're good in math, you can gauge how old I am right now. <laughs> so um, I was born there, and my parents were actually a Catholic at the time. Let me show you my parents. Uh, my mom is Filipina, so she's Ilonga from Ilo Ilo Bacolod. Meron ba tayong mga Ilonggo dito? Can you raise your hands? Wonderful. Siguro kung nasa Bacolod tayo, mag-ihilonggo ako. But to be fair to everyone, I'll speak English today. Um, and my dad, he's German. So 
you have a nice um, mix of Filipino and German, um, which is Sandra. And then I also have three brothers, all younger than myself, but all taller than me. Uh, so basically, I had a very nice childhood growing up. I was able to travel quite a bit. And what's wonderful is that everywhere that we would travel as a family, God would always expose us to Seventh-day Adventist people. So he started in the hospital. Uh, the doctor that delivered me, his name was Dr. Hayden. Um, and even the doctor that delivered my brother in Taiwan, uh, they all either came from Loma Linda or from the United States. And then wherever we would go, whether it be the U.S. or Philippines or Germany, we would always meet Seventh-day Adventists along the way who, in retrospect, I remember, were very good examples of people of God. They exemplified good character and they were always helpful to us, even if we weren't necessarily Seventh-day Adventists. And they were very simple and very careful with health. That's something that stuck with especially my mother because she was also searching for the truth at the time. But it wasn't until about the age of 16, I would say, when I was in high school, that I had my very first real Bible study. Now, that Bible study had such a big impact on my life. In fact, there were three main topics that gripped me and convicted me that the real pure truth is actually among Seventh-day Adventists, not any other religion. Can I hear an amen for that? Yeah, so the, the real deal, is the light, the pure true light is actually among us Adventists today. And um, I'd like to share real quick with you what those three main topics were that really gripped me and actually convinced me that this was a true light and faith and religion. The first one is actually the truth about the true day of worship, which is the Sabbath day. Now, growing up as a Catholic, I was used to the Sabbath or the day of worship being Sunday, and uh, it's just what we grew up with. But when I found out through Bible study that that true day of worship was actually Saturday and not Sunday, I was really shocked. I don't know if some of you can relate to me, but um, it's almost like I felt like I was on the wrong track all my life and being deceived in a way. But not intentionally, it's just that I, I, I didn't know any better. And so I did my own research, because I'm also pretty savvy and studious, and I want to make sure that I validate what is taught to me. So I researched and I found out that it's true. Back in 8530-ish, um, Emperor Constantine shifted the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday so that he could expand his kingdom, right? And win over Christians and pagans and, and mix everyone together. So that was um, the reason this shift happened. And lo and behold, uh, I, I actually wanted to share this information in high school with people. So I had a thesis assignment to do and I could choose any topic. And my topic that I boldly and bravely decided to choose, which was going to be technically audited and read by a reverend Catholic, um, was this topic, Sabbath versus Sunday, which is a true day of worship. So interesting enough, it was a risk that I took, but since I backed it up with a lot of facts as a high school student, I was able to pass, thank God, and I, I did um, a good job, apparently. So I'm glad that I, I stood for that as early as a high school student. So if there's any of you young kids here among the youth that are still in high school, one way to share is even just through your homework or through assignments or to your classmates, there are really ways to get creative and share the light that you live by and that you believe in. I did it as early as high school. Now, the second truth that also convicted me is the concept of prophecy that we study. So, when we covered that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and Daniel was able to interpret, right? Um, you know, the four kingdoms represented through the statue. For me, that was mind-blowing. I was like, this is real. And to understand how how the Bible interprets itself when you see the connections between Daniel and Revelation 
um, you know, and how, let's say, uh, certain words are literal and symbolical, like a woman could be literally a woman in the Bible, but could also represent the church, right? So to really be able to understand this from within the Bible and not another human's interpretation, to me, told me that this is very accurate. I love this. So that also convinced me that the Seventh-day Adventist faith is accurate. And the third truth is the truth about the health message. So when I found out how temperance was exercised among characters in the Bible like Daniel, um, or even like Jesus, right, especially regarding appetite, and how from the beginning the enemy used appetite to tempt us to disobey and to separate us from God through sinning, um, through what we eat and do with our temples, I was like, wow, this is real. You know, this is accurate. And it is because of these precious truths, the Sabbath, prophecy, and health, that I was actually convicted and convinced that we have the truth. So if ever you're actively sharing right now or plan to share, um, you know, for someone like a Miss Earth to be convinced, this is what it took for me to be convinced. So if you're already... Um, a Bible worker or a culprituer and, uh, you know, or you, let's say you cook great vegetarian dishes, you know, you, you're on to something that can convince maybe another Miss Earth or you never know, right? Like someone of influence. So I thank God for this. And from that point onwards, I started to apply these truths in my life. I, I went to church with my mom and my siblings on Sabbath instead of Sunday. And then we also started to practice the health message by a adapting a vegetarian diet step by step. Not going to deny it was a bit challenging because there's so many good food options right now, especially in our generation. But I really sincerely wanted to clean up my temple and make sure that everything I eat and drink is for the glory of God, step by step, you know. So that's what I did. And then while I had these Bible study series in the Philippines, eventually um, I had graduated from high school and it was time for me to go to college and um, it's wonderful because God actually gave me the opportunity to study in New York so I took up nursing in New York and I was able to graduate as well um, from this course in New York it was also in New York in 2008 that I finally after 10 years of practicing Seventh-day Adventist truths decided to get baptized so I was um, baptized pretty much like a decade ago 11 years ago um, in New York for those of you who are curious and this was at the Seventh-day Adventist um, church in Manhattan there we go so that was basically my journey building up to how I became an Adventist now a city like New York is very vibrant and at the time I was working hard and although I was keeping the Sabbath and I had you know my angels who were people at my church supporting me whether it be through housing or through you know just friendship I was still working so hard to achieve something for myself you know, I told myself, I'm already here in the States. I want to try many things. I want to graduate with honors. I want to make my family proud. Um, I want to build a name for myself. So as I was constantly in this mindset, I started to graduate with honors. And uh, I basically analyzed what I'm going to do next with my life. Um, I didn't really want to practice nursing, honestly speaking. Like I come from a family of nurses, and I always thought it would be a good backup. But I wanted to do more with my life um, and back then my mindset was very different like I you know I really wanted to build a name I want to be famous I wanted to be famous for something leave a mark in this world so I was also curious what other opportunities I could explore now that I got my education out of the way so when I traveled back to Manila almost instantly I was approached by so many pageant mentors to join pageantry so they said you've got the height you've got the look You've got the brains, you've got the body, you should join Miss Philippines.
teens. So <laughs> I told myself this night, I just worked so hard. You know, I graduated from nursing, got my N NCLEX down. You know, maybe I should. Maybe I should try it and see what other opportunities, um, you know, open and come my way. And true enough, I joined Miss Philippines Earth, which is a pageant about environmental advocacies. And when you win, you get to do projects that protect the environment. I even justified to myself that I could, you know, I could also lift up God because, you know, nature is where you experience God a lot when you're around nature. So I, I justified to myself that it's a good pageant to join. So I did, and thankfully God was being very patient with me because now, in retrospect, when you think back, it's really not ideal for us to join pageantry, especially when you have to ramp around in a two-piece and expose yourself and swimwear but <laughs> it is too late now right <laughs> um, so I've kind of been through that and God just must have blinked and you know told himself oh my daughter dear I hope that you wake up and come back to me but at that point I think I really just put him in the closet locked him up for a while and forgot about baptism you know I was just like let's try this you know this is all so glamorous and I can help my family I can earn money I can build a name for myself so imagine like even when you get baptized to the kids that were up here earlier um, I'm really really happy and proud of you guys for choosing to walk with the Lord this early in your lives you're on to something great um, try not to be like at Sandra and like get back lured into the world because as you grow up you'll see that just from the influence around you from social media from from people like your friends that are not necessarily Adventists you know, they, they're on to their own lives and building things for yourself so it's easy to get carried away and want that too but just always remind yourselves that at the end of the day you know being an Adventist and following Christ is really the best decision that you can make long term okay not necessarily short term but long term because heaven is our goal right um, yeah so where was I basically I joined the pageant won the local crown which is Miss Philippines Earth which enabled me to represent the Philippines in the international finals Miss Earth where I won first runner up so uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and now I had two earthly crowns right Miss Philippines Earth and Miss Earth Air and clearly that did open a lot of opportunities as I had anticipated so I was on to different photo shoots left and right um, I was actually also um, representing different brands like PETA I was an ambassador for the people of ethical treatments for animal rights uh, so I, I did quite a bit with that title that I had. I also um, went from competing in pageants to hosting them and judging pageantry. I became like a pageant mentor as well along the way. And I really would just be invited to host different events, as Mike mentioned, for corporate companies and really just give my testimony about being a beauty queen. Not about the Lord, but being a beauty queen. Who is Sandra Seifert? What am I up to? What am I doing with this life of being a beauty queen? So it was all about myself. And when I think back in retrospect, I really was trying to lift myself up with my own abilities, you know, just constantly doing it for myself. It wasn't for the Lord back then. And I'd also be like on magazine covers, maybe not in the right outfit, <laughs> um, but I'd really be all over the place and I'd travel, I'd meet famous people along the way that you might be familiar with. So <laughs> it was quite a journey, to be honest, and it may seem really amazing, you know, to, to meet all these people, and they're great, by the way. Manny Pacquiao is a nice guy. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, no one really compares to Jesus. So, yeah, I've, I've experienced it enough to be able to confirm it. And uh, one more thing that I did while I was, you know, on a roll in all this fame, glitz, and glamour of life is um, I even decided to start my own business. So I teamed up with another beauty queen. She was my business partner. And among all the things that we decided to focus on in fashion, we decided to launch a swimwear line. So, 
When you think back a few years to the, that day that I was baptized, or even further to the day where I was gripped by the three truths, you know, um, of being a Seventh-day Adventist, like that was kind of all locked up in the closet with Jesus as well. And I was completely, completely, um, you know, I don't want to say brainwashed, but just blinded. And yeah, like I just wanted to do my own thing and God patiently protected me, but really, like, I think he must have been like, oh dear. And so it wasn't until one specific experience that followed, uh, that was followed by others that finally like woke me up. And that first experience was when I started to work on Sabbath. So there were these great opportunities where I could make like an easy 500 to to $1,000 in like less than an hour um, if I would just do a guest appearance on a morning show on Saturdays. So I told myself, you know what, I'm going to go do that. And then after that TV appearance, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to give tithes and offerings. <laughs> At least I'm giving it back to the Lord. So um, it's not just really for me, all of it. <laughs> At least. So I would really justify to myself. And it's really true. You know, I had a conversation with um, Michael, uh, who picked me up from the airport when I got here. And he told me, the heart is very wicked and deceitful. Who can know it, right? Our hearts, like, we tend to justify to ourselves what it is that um, we think is best for us and probably God would also support. But clearly, if you think about it prayerfully also, um, we're not always right. Usually we're wrong and, and God is right. But we need to make room for that voice and God's will to to enter into our hearts. So what I did was I basically um, you know, thought it would pass. I gave my tithes and offerings for that Saturday appearance. And then a few weeks later, someone came up to me and asked me from church, Sis, is it true that you actually performed a dance number on Sabbath on Channel 2? And I was like, wait a minute, how do you know that? You're Seventh-day Adventist, you should be in church that day. <laughs> I was just trying to protect myself, honestly, but um, they were right. And so I was really like embarrassed, and I did say and admit that it was true. Um, and I really have to pray about it, and that they should pray for me too, and they did. And so that experience kind of you know, steered up a little guilt in my heart, which I'm thankful for, because who knows, maybe I would have remained lost forever if that didn't happen. And then it was soon followed by another experience, which was the turning over of my crown to my successor, right? So both crowns were eventually turned over. And when that happened, I felt emptier than before. Because of course, when, when you're the one who's the reigning queen, the attention's on you, the opportunities are on you, but when you pass that on, it's a new woman. So basically, it, for me, it made me realize that everything in this world really is temporary and transient, right? Like even a crown, even being Miss Earth is um, a temporary thing. They may say once a queen, forever a queen, but it's different. You know, once you pass on your moment, someone else will take that moment on until she passes it on as well. So that happened along with me working on Sabbath where I started to feel more and more alone. And then I started to feel experienced betrayal in business, um, which was really hard for me to accept because that, that f partnership began with friendship and now all of a sudden I was experiencing betrayal and backstabbing and, you know, people that used to be your friends weren't really your friends in the industry and they weren't necessarily booking you for jobs for you, but really they would just be after the next best thing, whoever is younger and more beautiful, that's who they would book. So I really almost felt like I was nothing, like from being all special and having all that attention to being alone and having no one, except Jesus, honestly, you know, he was really there for me, and when that moment came that I was all alone at rock bottom, you could really say, um, I decided to open up my Bible again and search the scriptures. At the end of the day, the apple doesn't really fall far from the tree, you know, when you were once with Christ, he will really go to the ends of the, the earth. He will wait patiently for you to come back to him and he will really try his best to put you through experiences that you might not necessarily like, that you might find uncomfortable and question him about, but he will put you through that if that's what it takes for him to win you back into his love. Amen? 
So he put me through all of that. He allowed that to also happen to me. And when I came across the verse in Colossians 3, 2, which reads, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, I realized that everything that I'd always wanted to build for myself was for the world, for the eyes of the world, for the people of the world, for myself. It was always about me. And then I came across another verse, which was so timely for that moment that I passed on my crown, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, which reads, can you read the part in red? I'll do black. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Okay. One more time. But we and incorruptible crown. So, you know, there's a lot of people that work so hard in their life to, you know, to build things, to build things for themselves, and they may receive acknowledgement and earthly gain for it, but it'll all pass, and I've experienced it, right? Um, so what we really should be aiming for as God's people is that incorruptible crown, that crown of life that awaits us in the mansions above when we meet our Creator. So having realized that from reading the Bible, I went back to reading the Spirit of Prophecy, which enabled me to come across this important text, which is found in the Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, page 138, and it reads, can you do red again? The ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to men have been committed to them, the Seventh-day Adventists, to be given to the world. Amen? Oh, that's a soft amen. Amen? I think we need to realize, brothers and sisters, what kind of light and truth we're dealing with. You know, some of us were born into the faith already, so we might have gotten used to it, numb, numb about it, tired of it. But when you really think about it, this is the truth. And there are people around this world that are searching for the truth, and the truth is amidst us. And what are we doing about it? Are we actually living by the light? Are we walking in the light? Are we sharing the light? That's what we should be asking ourselves. And that's what I asked myself after I turned over that crown. Sandra, you have the light, and you've been working so hard um, to use your influence to glorify yourself when you should be glorifying God. God and soul winning, witnessing for others and sharing that light. You know, I always say to people now, the light is so beautiful, why hide it? You know, you can share the light in so many creative ways. You don't have to be up here speaking to an audience. Um, we all have our own respective talents and gifts for that. But you can be creative. And even if you just share it with one person, the goal is for us to get to heaven and for our families and friends and as many souls as possible to get to heaven with us. Amen? So we got to work hard. Satan is working double time for souls to be lost permanently. And we have the light. And what are we doing to, you know, help God's end time ministry and spread the gospel? So we need to realize what we're dealing with. Uh, so when I realized that, and I had that moment, I basically decided, okay, I'm going to commit myself, recommit myself, maybe is a better word, to the Lord, and I'm going to start speaking for Him, not for myself. So that's what happened. I started off within our own Seventh-day Adventist churches, and then I put my nursing background to good use, and I would start teaching health, because remember, health is the right arm of the gospel in the last days. So if, if it's hard for you to reach someone who's influential, who's very educated, you can always start with health because everyone cares about their health, right? So it's, it's, it's a great entrance for us to reach out to people. And in these last days, there's a lot of diseases going on. People are suffering from high blood pressure, arthritis, diabetes, cancer, left and right. So it's a great opportunity to reach out, to be helpful to them. Just like those Adventists in... 
my youth were just helping us in however they could, um, my family and I, right? So we can do that too. We can be helpful to people, helpful to strangers, to loved ones. Uh, what else? I also started to speak in different churches, especially to the children. Um, you know, one of the, the most important commandments among the ten is the fifth commandment, which I value more today than before, on, honestly, because I would really just want to do my own thing when I was younger, not necessarily listen to my parents all the time. But it's so important that we honor our parents. You know, our parents have raised us and they've worked so hard since we were children to, you know, feed us, to dress us up, to wash us, to do so many things for us, for us to get a, a good education. So as children, especially children living in America, we might take our parents for granted, but we should be grateful because God is using our parents to guide us. And as parents, of course, we should also um, make that great effort to solidify our relationship with our children and also train them in the Lord. Amen? So it's important that we value, you know, the relationship between children and parents. And that as children, we honor our parents. It's the first commandment with a promise. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth. You will live longer if you honor your mom and your dad. So that's what I always try to also remind the children about during my sharing moments. And then it got to a point where... I would even share in prison. Could you believe that? We went to um, do ministry on my birthday, actually, at the Mandaluyong um, jail for women. And it was such a blessing because women in jail, or people in jail in general, they have nothing to do. They have no real like schedule or agenda. They're not busy. They have free time. And sometimes, you know, people find Christ in jail. Sometimes a man needs to be locked up behind bars for him to actually find Christ. So we decided to really um, get into jail ministry and we visit a certain group and now it's gotten to a point that the regular Bible study with that group has their own leader within the jail and this woman is actually about to be released but can you imagine this? She's not worried about leaving jail. She's not worried about, you know, how life would be once she leaves the jail. She is thinking maybe she should just stay in jail so she can continue to teach the women that are there with her. So we are praying for this sister because she's actually innocent when you look at her track record. I mean, they all say they're innocent, but I think she genuinely is innocent. <laughs> but yeah, like it's gotten to that point where even if you want to get creative and reach out to people behind bars, there are ways. God can help you find ways to reach out to people. And then there is this other group of people that we reach out to. And this is something that I, that I love to do and it's very dear to me because it happens on Sabbath. And this is um, an outreach we do every Sabbath after lunch. We go to a specific area in Pasay in, in Manila, which is called Mabini Street. So it's near Rojas Boulevard for the Filipino community who's aware. Um, it's down there. And every Saturday, we do a short Bible study with people on the streets. Now, it's interesting because we started to develop a relationship with them to the point where they come every Sabbath. They're always waiting for us. Um, they don't miss a Sabbath. Some even come when it's raining. Can you believe that? And um, we literally like share the word of God and then at the end we give them a, sh a simple snack and I've recently started to share health with them. I know it, it was quite um, you know I, I wasn't certain about sharing health because I thought to myself maybe they don't care about health because they just care about their next meal so they'll eat whatever um, they can get but I decided to do it anyway and I was so amazed how most of these people though they may be living on the streets they were so interested in health and a lot of them are suffering from different diseases and they're trying to apply the tips that we're sharing with them so I was really really excited to be doing all this work and getting great feedback and responses to the point where God really enabled me to speak not just in small churches not just um, in prisons or even on the streets but but he took me to like a whole nother level where you could see that I was speaking to massive audiences so churches would be filled people would be standing um, not even sitting anymore just to hear the word of God um, you know we would go across the Philippines and it's amazing because this time around since I was doing 
God's will and not my own will, God still allowed me to do all these great things like travel to different places. I mean, got to a point where we were even in Papua New Guinea. Um, next slide, right there. Um, um, sharing with our sisters and brothers in other countries. And I even got to go to Dubai, where I was also sharing with um, our brethren in Dubai. And last year, I think it was in the US already twice, just for ministry, last year and two years before that. So God is amazing, and God can do mighty things with us and our talents if we allow his will to be our will. Um, take note, if I was on covers for Miss Earth, he also put me on the cover of magazines, but this time to glorify him. And he also allowed me to meet famous people. Maybe not Manny Pacquiao, but people like Doug Bachelor, you know? And for me, that is just beautiful. And I realized that what is written in James 4.10 is true. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. And he really did that. And this time it was the right way. So in the past, I would always lift up myself for me, for selfish interests. But this time, I was Jesus helped me lift myself up to lift him up. Does that make sense? Yeah? So that was kind of the journey that I started to take on. And of course there are trials along the way, um, but never get discouraged. The narrow path is narrow for a reason. And I think Ellen White says, it's easier for a needle to go, or a camel to go through a needle in a haystack than it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's not easy to enter heaven. Um, you know, to, to face God during worship, to be among angels and not humans anymore. Um, that's like a whole nother level, but God's working in our hearts and preparing us here on earth to get to that level where we will be ready. So we need to you know, pay attention to the time that we have left, make use of the opportunities that we have right now. You're in the United States, you have opportunities here. God wants you here for a reason, or maybe he needs you here for now, but then he'll move you. Just work with him, work with his ministry, and you know you will not regret it at the end of the day. People may be successful now in the world's eyes, and we may envy them when we see them on social media, you know. But at the end of the day, it's not about how you enjoy the journey; it's how you finish your journey on earth, so that we get to the next, the next heaven. And. Um, I'm almost done actually, but I do want to share one more light that is so unique to the Seventh-day Adventist truth that has also gripped me. It's the fourth light um, of truth, and that is the truth on modesty in dress, especially for women, because women are so prone to um, fashion, caring about appearance, being fashionable. I was there myself. I was a beauty queen. I always wanted the best dresses, the most expensive dresses, and I've really worn dresses that are worth $20,000 and, you know, feel very confident and, um, yeah, good in them back then, but when I think about it and when I study God's word, um, it's so contrary to what his desire is for us women. If you look at um, the Bible verse in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10, um, which really moved me and helped me to transform my entire wardrobe to simplicity and modesty, it says there, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So God doesn't really care about our appearance as much as he cares about our hearts. So women, you know, although we need to, of course, dress in a way that is separate from the world, and that's something I advocate for now, we must always remember that the most important beauty is the beauty inside. The beauty that doesn't fade, the beauty that we can take from this world to the next, which is character. So we really need to be working on our characters. You may have a really beautiful woman dressed in the, the most sparkling gown, have the most beautiful smile, earn the most money, but if her heart is not with the Lord and she has um, a dark character, that woman is a waste and she's lost. And we don't want 
to end up like that woman. I address um, the women in particular because we're very prone to it. Um, you know, when you open your Instagrams, when you open social media, Facebook, even television, celebrities, you know, they're all setting certain trends and styles which endorse more revealing um, wardrobe, which endorse a lot of skin exposure, a lot of makeup, really just like changing your physical appearance and in, um, in the long run, even becoming a stumbling block for men. You know, they say it's not so safe for women anymore nowadays, but I, I feel that a woman can really control the amount of respect she can earn for herself if she dresses properly just by dressing modestly and respectfully she can make someone respect her from dress alone amen so it's important that like, for women if you feel that men don't really respect you or uh, look at you in a certain way um, start with your dress start to dress the biblical way and um, you know God will clearly like enhance your beauty and work on that character of yours so remember how I said when I was still in my Miss Earth days I started a business um, which was a swimwear line uh, this time I decided to start a business not with a beauty queen as my partner but with God as my business partner and um, I launched it about three years ago and I really just you know took baby steps to release it because um, I want God to lead it people always ask me you know what are your marketing strategies people approach me for investments I haven't taken any of that a lot of um, these opportunities are coming from unbelievers and I understand now you know being a businesswoman myself today that it's important that if we can do business with seven-day Adventists it is preferred by the Lord it is better um, God can bless that business more so I'm really careful with who I work with and I also try to make sure that the message and the principles of modesty um, don't you know don't change that it remains firm because I do have clients since we focus on custom fashion as well that want a bit more of a revealing look and I can't force them to wear modest clothes but I will encourage them and I will definitely try as I design for them um, but I have also released some Sabbath dresses and um, I'd love to show you that modesty and simple clothing can be beautiful because people think that oh when we wear you know something modest or Sabbath dress we might look like our Lola they say in the Philippines or like our granny in English but no there is a way to dress modestly but still fashionably in, in our time and get the message across and that's what I prayed for to the Lord and he gave me a small team to, that shares that vision to make it happen on a smaller scale and hopefully in God's perfect time on a bigger scale where even through fashion you know we can be a light to that dark industry and um, reach more um, people um, in, the, in the world in these last days. So here are some examples um, of some designs that um, are currently being released that are Sabbath dresses and it's, it's wonderful. God really lifts up this brand as well. He's enabled me to even dress the choir of the President of the Philippines. So Duterte's choir, yeah, Presidential Choir is also dressed by um, us, Sir Villa. And um, many celebrities, Bea Alonso, Sarah Geronimo, Tony Gonzaga, Colleen Garcia, you name it. Like These are more familiar probably to the Filipino community. But we've dressed them all and it's it's a great privilege to be able to dress women in more modest apparel. And one thing that I also try to do now is to use and find opportunities, even in business, to share the gospel. For instance, when I submit an order to a buyer, uh, the clothes come with hang tags, and the hang tags have a Bible verse. It's Proverbs 3130 about the virtuous woman and, you know, beauty being deceitful, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So in little ways, my clients are starting to notice these things, and I even indicated that it should be used as a bookmark so that they don't throw it away, so it's hardbound. Um, yeah, so there are ways to get creative about sharing the gospel and getting a response. 
and uh, also my staff since I'm their employer um, technically I can do whatever I want with them no but um, I can you know ask them to join me for Bible study so my staff that's not necessarily Seventh-day Adventist they have started Bible study series once a week we usually do it on Thursdays around 6 p.m. Um, and we started out as like a small group of like my two employees myself my mom and eventually we've started to grow and we have more attendees now that are not necessarily my staff but just you know people from the community including other beauty queens so you know step by step I'm praying for this like we can share the gospel and in a very organic non preachy way too that um, you know people are so drawn to me not necessarily for being Miss Earth now but also for the designs that are so modest and you know I've had this conversation with Shana like if the royal family in London like Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle can dress modestly but tastefully what more the sons and daughters of God you know they may be of royalty on earth but we are of royalty of the heavenly kingdom we need to be setting the tone and they should be following in our footsteps so the message of dress is really important in these last days and it's an amazing opportunity to reach out to people just from what we wear because let's face it before you talk to someone and before you let's say eat with someone you can already tell by their wardrobe that they are you know let's say Seventh-day Adventists because of what they wear right so we have to set that distinction finally after all this glitz and glam and this entire journey that I've been on so far in my 35 years of life I really have truly realized um, as you can see in Mark 8.36 that you know, no matter what you aim for in this world it really isn't greener on the other side the grass and everything is temporary and there is a risk that we might lose our entire soul and our opportunity at heaven if we pursue that curiosity path that technically killed the cat right so we need to really think carefully about what we do with our lives how we move forward who we lift up ourselves or the Lord and it's so interesting when we were backstage earlier and uh, one of the pastors prayed for us uh, I was introduced as Miss Earth 2009 but then one of the pastors said are you Miss Earth or Miss New Earth <laughs> And I was like, I like that, you know? And so going back to this overall concept of being a beauty queen, you know, I've, I've had my fair share of earthly crowns um, as Miss Earth, but what I really care about now is that heavenly crown. You know, that crown that no one can take away from me, that crown that really can be adorned with jewels for all the souls that we can, you know, save in this world through Jesus and the Holy Spirit guiding us and using our talents and channel um, as a blessing to others. So I really care about that heavenly crown and that crown of life. And I hope that all of you can also make that decision. I pray for that to really aim for an earth, not an earthy crown, but a heavenly crown, you know, a crown of life. And um, I also want to take this moment to, to really give back the glory to the Lord for bringing me to the United States, for enabling me to meet such amazing people that I would really never trade in friendship for any other journey in life. And there are several people here today. Some of you I've just met last night. Some of you I've met a few days ago, a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, and some of you I've known since I was young. And while for most speakers, they're invited to, let's say, a church in California, for me personally, this is like a gathering of Seventh-day Adventists that are so dear to my heart and here today. They've, some of you have driven all the way from Las Vegas to be here and, and from different parts of the U.S. So thank you. I thank God. It's, it's really a special moment for me personally to be here. And um, I pray with all my heart that if we don't see each other again in this lifetime, that we really all make it to heaven safe and sound with our families and with our loved ones. Um, parting words, 
I just like to encourage all of you to think about the talents that God has given you, whether it be the talent of music, the talent of speech, the talent of cooking, the talent of putting people together, the talent of maybe carrying Bibles for someone, you know, Bible working, culpaturing. There are so many talents, um, and God has given all of us an equal share. But even if He's just given us one talent, right? If you look at the parable of the talents, what will you do with that one talent that you have for the Lord in this end time generation that you were born into? So think carefully about that and remember that every decision you make has an effect and can also affect your salvation, whether it be that partner that you choose to walk with in life and in love, whether it be to honor your parents or not, everything has consequences. And if you do serve the Lord and you're not seeing the response and the benefits, maybe firsthand or right away, remember when we get to heaven, there will be people coming up to you and I telling us, thank you, because it's because of you that I'm here today. So we might not know it in this lifetime, but we will surely find out in the next. So I pray with all my heart that your journey with the Lord will be more enhanced, that my simple story as a former beauty queen who's pursued the world and really not found any joy in it at the end of the day except through Jesus, you know, will also be an, um, an encouragement to you. Finally, never forget that you are never alone, that Jesus is always right there. So if you've locked him up in the closet, please let him out again and let him work and let his will be your will. Let's um, stay in touch. Um, I also am active on social media, trying to be for ministry now. So please follow me on Instagram and reach out to me. I try my best to reply to everyone who reaches out in God's perfect time. Happy Sabbath and God bless you all. And thank you again for your time and for, for serving the Lord in your own special way.